This is one of the reasons I've been talking about the power of God. And I've been saying that the power of God plus the love of God equals hope. And so tonight I want to talk about another angle of the power of God. And the angle that I want to focus on tonight, and we'll get to it in a little bit, is the image of God. That he has revealed his power in our lives when he made us and stamped us with his, his very own image. So as we dig into this, I invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Psalm uh, number 8. Psalm 8. We're going to begin by looking at Psalm 8, and then we're going to go to Genesis 1. So turn with me in your Bible to Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. The psalmist David writes, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? He begins right by, by referring to God as the sovereign Lord, meaning he has no equal. He is superior to everything and everyone. He has no equal. He has no superior. He is the sovereign God. How majestic is your name in all the earth. He's describing his glory. He says uh, he, says he, sees, the, he sees this glory uh, in the heavens above. The glory of God cannot be contained in the earth. It is extended to the heavens above. You know, if you were to take a, on a dark night, look in the sky, you could maybe see 5,000 stars. If you used a telescope that was four inches long, um, you could see about uh, 10 million stars. But if you look at a, through a, micro, a telescope from uh, uh, one of the big ones, you know, with the big domes uh, at Griffith Park and so forth, you can see a billion stars. If you could travel uh, by the speed of light, it would take you 40 billion years to get to the edge of the universe. And God's glory fills all of that and beyond. And then he says, even the babies declare your glory in this text. Even the little babies. And it's true, you know, as you, uh, when you have a child and you hold that little baby in your arms and, and you reflect on the, the miracle of birth, it's just mind-boggling. You can't believe it. You can't really understand any of it. It exceeds our, our ability to comprehend. And yet you're looking right at the glory of God. And you look at the hands and the, the little fingers of that little baby and I've always been amazed how they come right out with, immediately they have little fingernails. They come full and complete, full, full packages. And it's just another declaration of the glory of God. And then the psalmist, he goes on and he, he says that, um, when I look at the heavens, uh, your work of your fingers, the moon and the stars. And then he says, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And when you think about how big the universe is and how complex, you realize how small we are as people. And yet, he says, God even recognizes and remembers us. What is man that you are mindful of him? You even remember us. And then he goes on in verse 5. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, in verse 5, he makes a reference to something we're going to focus on tonight. It's really more of a poetic way of talking about the image of God, the image of God. He says, we are created a little lower than God, yet we are crowned with his glory. We are crowned with his glory, and we are given dominion 
over all that he has created in this world. That's a part of that image of God. And we've been given dominion over all that he has created. And so it's highly moral to use animals as work animals, even food. Uh, we are to do it hum humanely, the scriptures teach. And, um, and we are to be good stewards of the planet that God has given us. We are meant to oversee it. We are meant to care for it. But we are meant to do so as good stewards, replenishing it, making sure we do not rob it for next generations. And uh, so we are meant to take care of God's world. And then he ends by saying the way he started, O Lord, you are sovereign. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You are that almighty, preeminent God, and you have created us in your image, in your image. Now, I wanted to focus on being created in the image of God tonight, because I think it can be something, when we understand it more clearly, it can be something that changes the way we think of ourselves. I deal with people all the time where they're very down on themselves, where they do a lot of self-loathing, uh, they don't like themselves, yet alone love themselves. They don't care about themselves. And so they're, they're and, and people don't walk around with signs saying, you know, I don't like myself. But yet a lot of people suffer from a, a low self-esteem, uh, kind of a self-loathing. And of course, then you have people that are just the opposite of that. And they're all, they're bigger than life and bragging. And uh, they think they're the, the best and the brightest and the smartest person in the room. But in my life, in my experience, and in my ministry, I have found that many times the people that are the most vocal about how wonderful and great they are, when you, when you pull back the covers, you begin to see that they suffer too from a low self-esteem. So when we can begin to understand that you and I have been created in the image of God, it is a game changer. It changes how we see ourselves and can give us greater courage and greater confidence. So turn with me now uh, to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look at uh, the story of creation in verses 26 to 28. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the living things that, that move upon the earth. So God has given us life. He's given you life. He's given us life. He's created us. Your life is extremely valuable, and he has given you and me life. And that in and of itself should encourage us and give us hope and, have us have a and help us to have a, a different attitude about ourselves. But I like how one very famous theologian and philosopher uh, put it. Uh, this is how Dr. Seuss put it. <laughs> if you'd never been born, well then what would you be? You might be a fish or a toad in a tree. Or worse than that, why you might not be, worse than that, you might be a wasn't. A wasn't has no fun at all. No, he doesn't. A wasn't just isn't. He just isn't present. But you, you are you. And now isn't that pleasant? Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. Shout loud, I am lucky to be what I am. Thank goodness I'm not just a clam or a ham or a dusty old jar of sour gooseberry jam. I am what I am. That's great to, a great thing to be. If I say so myself, happy birthday to me. <laughs> well, thank you. So you see, you're not a wasn't. You've been given life. The God of heaven and earth, the almighty, everlasting God has given you life. 
And then it said in the text, let us make man in our image. Uh, who's he talking to? For those uh, who might be listening online or even someone here tonight who maybe has questions about this idea of the Trinity and the, the triune God, looking for evidence, is it really in the Bible? The word Trinity is never used in the Bible, but the idea is there over and over again. And here's a great example of it. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Who's the our? He's speaking as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, the triune God. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, what does it mean to be in the image of God? Well, it means that so much of what we are, so much of who we are, so much of the way we conduct ourselves is because we have been marked and stamped with the image of God. So we are able to have emotions. We're able to be sad. We're able to be happy, even angry. We're able to think and use our minds. We're able to be creative. We're, be, we're able to be present and recognize where we are and who we are, at least usually. And so we're able to use our mind, we're able to reason, we're able to have logic. Where did we get all that from? Well, it came from God who created us in His image because He is all those things and more. And so we do those things because our Heavenly Father who created us is all of those things. Um, why is it we love beauty? Why is it we love art? Why is it we love music? We love music. It, it does so much for us. It comforts us. It inspires us. It causes us to get up and dance. We're writing it, new songs all the time. Think of all the new songs that are constantly coming before us. Music is, is just everywhere, and it brings us great joy. And the beauty of creation all around us and, and the artwork that we see, why do we enjoy these things? Because God is an artist. Because look at what He created. The beauty of his creation is an indication that God loves beauty and God loves art and God loves music and it's no wonder we love those things too. It's why we know the difference between right and wrong. We have a moral compass and a foundation morally because we've been created in the image of God. Now there are atheists who have tried to argue that this is... Uh, uh, even more evidence that uh, there is no God, actually. For example, Sam Harris, uh, eminent uh, atheist, has written these words. If you are right to believe that religious faith offers the only real basis for morality, then atheists should be less moral than believers. I'll read it again. If you are right to believe that religious faith offers the only real basis of morality, then atheists should be less moral than believers. Well, what poor Sam doesn't know is that you and I did not receive our knowledge of right and wrong from religion, even from the Bible. It was in our very being the minute we were conceived. Because God is a moral God, we received that because we have been marked with his image. We have been created in the image of God. Therefore, we have a moral foundation. That's why an atheist can be moral. Certainly our Bible enhances it, but you have morality because you were created with it. You know the difference between right and wrong because you were created with it. The Bible says the con that, that the law of God is written on the heart. You have a conscience because God has a conscience. God knows the difference between right and wrong. God has a moral code and a moral compass, and therefore you and I do as well. Why do we like relationships so much? We're, we're drawn to relationships. Being under this COVID time has been challenging, and one of the biggest challenges is that we haven't been able to be together. We can't even get together sometimes as families. People are stuffed away in nursing homes and their grandchildren have to speak to them through glass windows. And it's killing us, literally, because we long for relationship. 
That's why we want to be married. That's why we want to have children. That's why we want to have relationships. That's why we are the body of Christ, the church, and want to gather together in small groups, large groups, cluster groups. Because God is a lover. And he loves people. And he wants to have a relationship with all of us. Individually and collectively, he loves relationships. So therefore, we love relationships. And so we're able to think. We're able to understand. We're able to have emotions. We're able to be creative. We're able to have a moral compass. We're able to uh, love music and art. We're able to um, have relationships. All because, and more, because we have been created in the image of God. Now, when you know that, it can change you. When you begin to understand that, it can begin to change you in terms of who you are. Because if you understand that everyone has been created in the image of God, then you have to treat people differently. You cannot be abusive to others, whether verbally or physically. You have to treat people differently. All of us have power at some level. Even children have power. And so we all have to stop and say, how am I using my power? If I'm a child, am I a bully? If I'm an employer, am I a bully? Uh, how do I treat my children? How do I treat my spouse? I have power. Everybody has power. And when you understand that everyone, everybody is created in the image of God, now you have to reevaluate how you use power. Uh, moreover, it's important to realize that um, you have to think about that in terms of even your own self. How do you treat yourself? How do you treat yourself physically? If we allow addiction, for example, to overwhelm us and destroy our life, we're not respecting the fact that I'm created in the image of God. You see, you cannot be a racist if you understand that everybody is created in the image of God. You cannot intellectually, honestly be a racist. That has to go away. Because God created every single human being with his image. In the terms of our own self, that's why we can never or should never commit suicide. Because we've been created in the image of God and we have tremendous value. And let me just say a word about suicide. Because suicide rates have risen during this time. Many people say they commit suicide when they survive and people can interview them and talk to them and help them. Many people say they did it because they couldn't take the pain anymore. Well, let me just say that suicide never ends the pain. It just transfers it to somebody else. It transfers it to a spouse, to a parent, to children, to friends. And they have to walk the rest of their life with a limp because you transferred your pain to them. And it's a very, very selfish act. And there's always hope. And if you're contemplating that, if that has occurred to you as an as a answer to your life, I assure you it isn't. And I assure you there is always hope. And we're here to help you. And we can. And we have with many, many people. Just reach out to us and we will. And so this idea of being created in the image of God changes everything. And it can change how we see ourselves because we begin to see ourselves as one who has great value. I read recently about a man by the name, he's an artist by the name of Banksy back in 2013. He uh, took a lot of his art and made a display on, uh, at Central Park in New York. And his artwork uh, uh, that he displayed was on white canvas with black ink and black paint. He was offering uh, each piece for $60 a piece. And uh, people would come by, they would look at the art, uh, they would pay attention to it, look at it, some even bought it. Um, one lady even got him to come down in price, got two for one. 
And then after a long day, he packed everything up and went back to his home. And what people didn't realize was this man, Banksy, was a very accomplished artist. Today, his art sells for $2 million a piece. But nobody knew. You see, I bring that up tonight because an artist determines the value of a painting. It's because of the artist that the painting has value. Uh, many of you know that I am a, a, a student of uh, American history. I love to read about American history. And uh, several years ago when our daughter was, I think, like in, in elementary school, we, we uh, wanted to take her on a trip to Virginia and uh, see a lot of the sites. So we went to Virginia. Uh, we went to uh, Monticello, to Thomas Jefferson's home. We went to Mount Vernon and saw uh, Washington's home there on the Potomac. Uh, we went into D.C. and uh, the first night in D.C. had the best crab cakes. I just have to point this out. The best crab cakes in Georgetown I've ever had in my life. And, uh, but then we went to the Capitol and the White House and so forth. And uh, I'll, I'll always remember this. We're walking along and our daughter says, can we do something I want to do? <laughs> and we said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I'd like to go to a museum and see some famous art. She'd been studying art in school. And we said, okay. I wasn't into it, but I said, all right. So we went to the Smithsonian. And they were having a special display of Monet and Man Manet. And we went in, and my life was changed. In that afternoon, I came out a different person. I loved everything I saw. I fell in love with art. I fell in love with great museums. And now, wherever I travel around the world, I love to go to a great art museum and, uh, and just... Take the day and be there and experience it. And it's been a rich, rich experience. And then fast forward many years later, uh, the Van Gogh collection came to the L.A. County uh, Museum of Art uh, from Amsterdam, a portion of it. And so we said we're going and we, we got there and we bought the headphones. And, and I remember, I'll never forget this, walking into the room with a display of, of one of Van Gogh's paintings called The Crows. We walk in the room and the minute we walk in the room, we hear the sound of crows. And then the narration began. It was just a magical moment. And then I, we saw the painting of the potato eaters, which is so powerful. I think uh, I've thought many times that Van Gogh is like... Um, you know, um, John Steinbeck of our time as a writer, Steinbeck, you know, with Grapes of Wrath and of Mice and Men and so forth, really, really in his writings depicted the plight of really, really poor people, migrant workers and the, and the like. And I think Van Gogh did the same thing with the potato eaters. You see their, their, their arthritic hands and the, 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 the knuckles that are so enlarged and the people look so dirty and tired and worn out as they've spent their lives working, just picking potatoes and eating potatoes, and that's all they've had. But seeing these Van Goghs was just one of the best days of my life. I was mesmerized. I had, had the same experience looking at the Mona Lisa in the Louvre in Paris. I, I couldn't step away. There's just something about the look in her eyes and her expression. And uh, Nat King Cole was right. And I, I just couldn't step away. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because art has its value because of the artist. If you, if you buy some painting from a painter in Laguna Beach, it's not going to be nearly as expensive as if you buy a Van Gogh or a Rembrandt or a Monet. They're going to be worth millions and millions and millions. And in fact, I would say the Van Goghs are probably priceless. And here's my point. That's what's happened to you and to me when God created you and stamped you and marked you with the image of God. He, the great artist, painted you. And you have value because the, the almighty, preeminent, everlasting God painted you and signed it with his own image. And that means you have value. You know, maybe you ought to, we ought to walk around saying, you know, I'm a Van Gogh. <laughs> Try that. Tell people that. I'm a Van Gogh. 
You know? I'm a Monet. They might think you're a little off. But that's what it means when you say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. The great preeminent artist, the sovereign God, painted me and then signed it by marking me with his very image. You see how that can change your outlook on life? You see how that can give you greater courage and greater hope? You see how that can cause you to have, uh, have, a, have a, you know, a, a strength within your character and your being? It changes everything. You are a child of God because you have been marked with the image of God. I want to close with this passage tonight from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the uh, third, 31st chapter in the third verse, the second half of the third verse. Here's what God says to you tonight. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Nobody can say that. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Only the sovereign God, the preeminent God can say, I've, I love you with an everlasting love. Because none of us have been everlasting people. We're going to receive everlasting life. But we didn't exist before we were born. Only God existed before we were born and he loved us then. And he's loved us with an everlasting love. And so when you combine the power of God, understanding it through the, the knowledge that we are created in the image of God, plus the, the love of God that we see in Jesus Christ who came to, to redeem this lost piece of art, it equals hope. Let us have hope. Let us pray tonight. Lord, you are the great artist and you've created us in your very image. We can't be the same knowing that. We can't think of ourselves in the same way. We can't even treat others in the same way, Lord. It's a game changer. It's a mind changer. It's a lifestyle changer. And so, Lord, help us to understand this more deeply and use it to transform our lives and give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen.